evolution of what happens. If you've got a good response, you've got helper cells, you've got cytotoxic T cells, you can even have gamma delta T cells or NK cells, all there to control tumor cells. But once those tumor cells start changing, they influence and have a negative impact on the immune response. So you start to lose some of the immune cells that were controlling the tumor. And eventually you lose all of them. You induce suppressive immune cells, which allow the tumor to grow uncontrolled. So another way to sum this up on one slide is you have two main problems with immune recognition. You can have that there's nothing on the tumor that the immune system can see, no recognition. Or you can have T cells that have seen peptides presented on MHC that they want to respond to, and they're there at the tumor. They want to try to eliminate that tumor, but they're being suppressed by cytokines or other regulatory cells. So you need to think about those two problems differently because how we might try to tackle those problems is going to be very different. I also just wanted to bring up the difference between cytotoxic T cells and NK cells, both of whom can help to eliminate tumors. Now, if you've got a tumor cell and it's expressing um, a mutated, so now foreign peptide on MHC, Cytotoxic T cells are going to do most of the work. And what this is showing you here is nude mice are laboratory mice that had a natural mutation that caused them not to have any hair, but it also caused them not to have any T cells. So if they don't have T cells, they cannot eliminate the tumor. But normal mice can eliminate this tumor. Now, if that tumor were to lose its MHC expression, then, of course, cytotoxic T cells become useless because their T cell receptor needs to see MHC with peptide. But NK cells, as we have learned, are very good at recognizing and killing cells that are not expressing MHC1 because they recognize that as being a problem. And in this case, the normal mice that have T cells and NK cells, they just don't have enough NK cells to eliminate the tumor. Turns out, though, that nude mice, when they have no T cells, have much higher levels of NK cells. And in this particular scenario, then the mice without T cells but lots of NK cells can eliminate a tumor. Now, this is an artificial situation, but it shows you the different roles that cytotoxic T cells and NK cells might be able to play in helping to eliminate a tumor. And this is just a picture from your textbook that shows actually an NK cell over there on the left killing a tumor cell. And you can see here the cell is starting to fall apart. All right, so we've learned about how your immune system can promote the growth of cancer. We've learned about how your immune system can fight cancer in all the different ways that T cells can see tumors. And also, we've learned that, by definition, in anyone who has cancer, that system has failed. So what can we do to change the landscape around tumors to try to get our immune system to work better? There are two sort of different arms of cancer immunotherapy, which is this field of using the immune system to help fight cancer. There's passive and active. Passive means your own immune system isn't doing anything, but we're taking advantage of what an immune system can do and giving it to somebody. So you can give someone the antibodies. I told you about this in the vaccine lecture. This also comes into play for cancer. And we'll learn about lots of different antibody therapies. And basically, using antibodies, because they can bind specifically to antigen, is more important in cancer immunotherapy than actually getting antibodies to work in a normal immune response, which is what we've learned about so far. 
You can then have active cancer immunotherapy, which is actually trying to get your own immune system to respond better to the tumor. That could be nonspecific, like those examples of infection, stimulating the immune system globally, and that helps fight the cancer. Or we can try to do it specifically with some cancer vaccines. And as you'll see, these are going to be very analogous to the vaccines we talked about for fighting infectious diseases. So again, if we're trying to modulate the immune system, we have to know what the problem is. Why isn't the immune system working right now to kill the tumor? And what problem are we trying to fix? So with a cancer vaccine, we're trying to stimulate an immune response in lymph nodes, activate T cells and B cells, activate an adaptive immune response that has not yet been activated. If these are activated, but they're still not killing the tumor, then we have to modulate what's going on at the tumor site where there's probably suppression of these activated cells or these effector cells. So I first want to talk about antibodies. Now, in the normal course of tumors, antibodies don't usually play a huge role. I've talked a lot about cytotoxic T cells, recognizing peptides and MHC, and not a lot about antibodies being able to fight tumors. But you can imagine there could be surface antigens on tumor cells to which adaptive antibody responses could be generated. Now, we could use a vaccine to try to stimulate antibody. We could also maybe use a vaccine to stimulate cytotoxic T cells, which would be better for tumors. But if you think back to our vaccine lecture, remember it's not so easy with a vaccine to get good cytotoxic T cell responses. But sometimes the problem is the antigens just aren't different enough in a tumor. So a vaccine may not help that. Um, and again, if they're simply overexpressed, although the T cell could recognize too much expression of the antigen on MHC as foreign, a B cell could never recognize too much antigen as foreign. Because remember, T and B cells see antigen differently. Now, even if your body makes antibodies to a tumor, they may not actually work to kill. So we do have a limited number of cancer vaccines. I showed you two of them in that um, historical timeline table. Uh, but we don't have a lot of cancer vaccines for all of these reasons. However, the biggest role for antibodies in cancer is with passive immunization or giving people antibodies for a lot of different reasons. And, and usually it's not that the antibody is directly killing the tumor. So I'm going to tell you about several different ways to use antibodies to target a tumor, but not that the antibody is directly responsible for killing the tumor. But let's start with cancer vaccines. What needs to be different about them? Well, first of all, they need to cure cancer, not just prevent it. That's different than most of our vaccines where we give them to somebody before they have the disease. Can't really do that with, with cancer because even though people get what's classified as the same type of cancer, like colon cancer, everybody's cancer is different. So there really isn't a way to make a vaccine like that. Ideally, you want this cancer vaccine to stimulate cytotoxic T cells. And if you remember the vaccine lecture, you can remember how hard that is to do. And I want you to think about, if we're going to create a cancer vaccine to try to um, treat a patient, what problem are we trying to overcome? Are we overcoming no recognition or suppression of the effector cells? So in this case, we're trying to overcome no recognition because we're trying to stimulate effector T cells to respond to the tumor, presuming that they don't currently exist. So this is a no recognition problem that we're trying to overcome with cancer vaccines. 
A few different approaches have been tried, and they're a little bit different than traditional vaccines. So the first is you actually take somebody's dendritic cells out of their body. You also take tumor cells from someone, and in vitro, you feed those dendritic cells tumor antigens. You're sort of artificially um, force feeding those dendritic cells, and they will do a better job of pre presenting that antigen. And then hopefully you put those dendritic cells back into the body and they'll stimulate cytotoxic T cells. If you don't take out the dendritic cells, you can do a more traditional vaccine. And DNA vaccines here work well for this because again, you need these antigens made within cells so they get presented on MHC class one. The other thing you can do, again, a little bit different than traditional vaccine, is to take a tumor cell from a patient and actually make it become more of a good antigen-presenting cell. So as you learned, the first interaction with a T cell um, and another cell presenting antigen is MHC and T cell receptor. But then you need second signals. So you can actually transfect tumor cells so that they express those co-stimulatory molecules, put them back into a person, and these cells then become antigen-presenting cells for the tumor. Now, another thing that's been tried is sort of linking tumor antigens to cytokines and using that as a way to artificially activate dendritic cells in vitro, even better than just antigen alone. So the cytokine together with the antigen really gets these dendritic cells revved up and they are really, really activated and they're gonna do the best possible job of stimulating T cells once you put them back into a person with cancer, ideally then these T cells get activated and they'll go and start to kill tumor cells. So if you wanted to sum up um, kind of the three different main ways of doing cancer vaccines, you can start over here with this is the more traditional vaccine approach. Take whether it's with a viral vector that we learned about, you can get a good CTL response, DNA, you can get a CTL response, or even peptide alone, which you might get more antibody response. You inject that into somebody, you are relying on a normal evolution of an immune response with activation of innate cells and then going to a lymph node and stimulating T cells to give you a response. The other two are, again, not relying solely on what's a normal immune response, but really trying to beef up a normal re immune response by taking out dendritic cells, feeding them tumor antigen that you actually got from the patient, and then putting back in these super revved up and activated dendritic cells, and they'll go to the lymph node and stimulate T cells. And that will be even better than actually relying on the sort of natural process. And over here, it's actually taking tumor cells themselves and creating good antigen-presenting cells from tumor cells, and they then can stimulate T cells. The ultimate goal here is to find a way to stimulate anti-tumor T cells that had not developed naturally in the person. Now, in addition to T cells, again, you can also get antibodies made to tumors. And as I talked about a few slides ago, there's some important uses for those antibodies, although it's not indirect killing of tumors like you would get with cytotoxic T cells that could directly kill tumor cells. So if you have a tumor-specific antibody, the way it would work naturally is often through an NK cell and allowing the NK cell to kill the tumor. But you can use antibodies simply as delivery systems. Remember, antibodies bind to one specific antigen with very high affinity and avidity. So they can be used to direct treatments specifically to tumor cells. You can have toxins or radionucleotides attached to antibodies, 
And those antibodies will go and seek out tumor cells, bind to them, and then these drugs are delivered directly to tumor cells. So we're not really asking the immune system to do anything in this case. We're taking advantage of what antibodies are known to be able to do. And in this sy system, the antibodies are simply a drug delivery system. Another thing you can do with antibodies is blocking antibodies. Antibodies that bind to their antigen might prevent that antigen from interacting with anything else. So we have blocking antigens that bind to surface receptors and don't allow those surface receptors to interact with their normal ligand. And we have quite a few of these blocking antibodies as current treatments for cancer. Initially, we had them for hematologic or immune cell cancers, and these are receptors on immune cells. You make an antibody to them, you give that antibody to a person, because their own immune system won't make a response to it, it's a self-antigen. But you can get another organism to make that antibody and passively give it to a patient. If you block the receptors, those cells can't, those receptors can't bind their ligand, they can't get growth signals, and they can die. And you can have antibodies to non-immune receptors. You have growth factor receptors here, epidermal growth factor and VEGR, which is very important for the growth of blood vessels. Cancers need that because that's their food supply. They need more blood to get more nutrients for their cells to grow. So what we've talked about so far with stimulating or using the immune system is vaccines. Can we stimulate an immune response that has not occurred already in somebody? Can we beef up anti-tumor immunity? We can use monoclonal antibodies to deliver drugs to help NK cells kill tumors and also to block receptor signaling, all in the hopes of killing tumor cells. And again, I, we haven't talked too much about it, but you could do nonspecific activation of the immune system like the uh, TB vaccine or bacterial infection or cytokines in the hopes that if you rev up the entire immune system, maybe that anti-tumor immunity that was not very strong might work better. So what we're trying to do here is you have to think about, again, whether you're trying to activate anti-tumor immunity or restore anti-tumor immunity that exists but's being suppressed. So what we've talked about so far is vaccines, using antibodies, that's all a way of activating immunity. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about restoring effector cells that are there that want to kill the tumor but they're being suppressed. So how do we overcome suppression? Um, or immune modulation of anti-tumor immunity. Well, it turns out one of our drugs, the antibody to VEGR, actually, although it wasn't considered to be immunomodulatory, is. Because it turns out that this molecule has effects on immune cells. And that's shown in more detail here. This um, protein, which absolutely promotes growth of blood vessels, also turns out to suppress innate immune cells, suppress effector T cells, and promote Treg production. All of those things would end up suppressing an immune response. So when we had a drug that prevented growth of tumors in another way, we actually learned that a very advantageous side effect, if you want to call it that, is that we were relieving this suppression of productive immune responses and also preventing promotion of a suppressive Treg cell. The last main um, category of immune modulators is the newest, and these are called immune checkpoint inhibitors. So when do you think you're going to use these? in the context of an immune response. This is not for the generation or stimulating anti-tumor immunity. 
These come after that immunity's already been stimulated, but for some reason is suppressed. And can we block that suppression? So I want you to step back and think about when you learned about how T cells get activated. What's shown in the center here is that remember the first interaction is a T cell receptor and MHC. But after that, the two cells, the T cell and the energy presenting cell, are having a conversation. They're each expressing different molecules that can interact in order to fully promote T cell activation. But not only does that interaction promote activation, it can promote suppression. And if you, you may not be able to read all of these over here, but in green, it's promoting the activation of the T cell, and in red is suppressing the activation of the T cell. So if we want to relieve suppression, we might block some of these interactions that would promote suppression of the T cell. And we have two main treatments for cancer that do this. They're actually antibodies that bind to important molecules, CTLA-4 and PD-1, or their receptors. And those interactions normally would supply negative signals to the T cell, telling it to turn off. They do it at different phases. So the priming phase. This is where you've got antigen presented to the T cell. T cell is trying to get activated. But if CTLA-4 is present on the T cell, then this T cell actually won't get its complete um, series of, of signal two and will never fully get turned on. So if you use an antibody to CTLA-4 that blocks this inhibitory signal, then you can allow for full activation of that T cell. PDLA, PDL1 actually works even later in the process works on effector cells. So if you had full activation of T cells in the lymph node, full priming, and those T cells went out in the periphery as effector cells to go and find their target and kill it, they still might be prevented from doing that because if the tumor cell expresses PDL1, it can turn off this T cell receptor and not allow the T cell to kill the tumor cell. If you block that interaction, with a blocking antibody to these negative regulatory signals, you can allow the T cell to kill the tumor cell. Treatments with antibodies to either the ligand or the receptor for PD-1 are some of the newest um, and uh, most worked on, I would say, cancer immunomodulatory treatments right now. But they don't work in everybody. So when can you use these treatments? If you have a strong endogenous anti-tumor response, but it's being suppressed, you can use anti-PD-1, and you should be able to restore the response to the tumor. If, however, you have a weak response to the tumor, it looks too much like self, the T cells never got activated, then your relieving suppression doesn't help. Those T cells aren't even there to fight the tumor and the drug isn't gonna work. Now, if you have a weak response, you could actually induce tumor immunity, say with one of those vaccines we talked about, but then maybe those T cells still don't kill the tumor because they're being negatively regulated right at the tumor site, then you could use this treatment and perhaps restore the anti-tumor response. That's just shown again in this picture. Ideally, you have a cytotoxic killer T cell. It's going to kill the cancer cell. If the cancer cell expresses PD-1, that will be an inhibitory signal to the T cell. No killing occurs. And if you use the drug to block this interaction, you can allow the T cell to kill the tumor cell. So, in summary, what have we learned today? We first talked about actually how our immune system can promote the growth of cancer. And that is mostly through inflammation and low levels of cytokines that cause a chronic inflammation, 
over many years. And this can often be associated with chronic infections like hepatitis C or helicobacter. Then we learned about, we spent the rest of the lecture talking about how can the immune system actually fight off cancer. In fact, it's quite good at it, and unfortunately it gets no recognition because every time our immune system succeeds, we never get cancer and we never know. We only know about the immune system failures in the context of cancer. But cancer cells, their hallmark is mutation. If proteins get mutated, then new epitopes can be created in several different ways, as we discussed, allowing T cells to see tumor antigens as foreign because they're new to the body and they never learn them as self. And then those T cells can target and kill the tumor cells. Now, as successful as this might be, we also know that tumors can evade immune destruction. They may do it by simply looking too much like self. They haven't had mutations in the right peptides that can get presented on MHC in order to stimulate T cells. Or if you have anti-tumor immunity, you stimulate these T cells as described up here, but the tumor microenvironment actually cause suppression of those effector T cells is another way that tumors can avoid destruction. Now, there are many different ways that we have tried and will continue to try to overcome this inadequate tumor immunity. If the problem is you don't get immune activation, then you can try to use vaccines to stimulate a stronger immune response. If the problem is that you have suppression, you can try to relieve that suppression. The other thing we talked about is using antibodies in lots of different ways as tumor immunotherapy. But again, you have to think about antibodies in this case a little bit differently. They don't function the way they normally do for most immune responses. We're actually using the ability of antibodies to bind an antigen specifically, either as a blocking mechanism to block a receptor in a ligand, or as a drug delivery system. So I hope you enjoyed the lecture today and can think about the immune system in the context of cancer, how it's similar to infections and how it also can be very different.